are here that I did not acknowledge. I love to acknowledge you and recognize your work. Thank you. Any other elected officials that are here that I did not? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, do you do this or that, the program? Okay. So, um, so um, we're ready to start with our program. I'd like to welcome President Jennifer Holm to uh, give some welcoming remarks. Thank you, Ms. Holm, for being here. tumultuous year we have had. When I thought about, the to, about today and the opportunity I have um, in addressing you, I initially found myself at a bit of a loss. What could I possibly say in a few short minutes that acknowledges where we are and also supports a vision for how PBUSD can move forward into the future? And then I listened to an interesting podcast on overcoming extreme political polarization. The heart of it is coming from a place of love and compassion. Compassion is certainly a, you know, a, a gift that we give other people. But it's also a gift that we give to ourselves. It's an essential component of creating an inclusive culture. Here's what it does not mean. It doesn't mean giving up our ideas. It's not about liking someone. It doesn't even mean that we don't feel anger and frustration at times. We still need to fight for what we believe in and sometimes passionately so. But compassion is about recognizing another person's inherent worth and dignity. I think about some of the significant issues our district has faced and is still facing keeping schools closed or reopening them, masking mandates, vaccine mandates, school resource officers, how we use available funds, and so on. However, the biggest challenge that we face in managing these issues is not necessarily the issues themselves, but how we treat one another as we grapple with possible solutions. We all have different perspectives and opinions, and sometimes those come into conflict. That conflict can be a healthy thing that allows us to identify areas of growth. But for us to use the full power of our diverse community, we cannot indulge in contempt for those with whom we disagree. Compassion is the approach that can pull us all forward together. Compassion is what allows us to recognize the humanity in others. What allows us to recognize an opponent without seeing them as an enemy. Even if the pandemic ends tomorrow, even if the chronic underfunding of our public school system was immediately rectified, there would still be other issues to address. Compassion is why I am thrilled about the work I get to do with the Pajaro Valley Education Foundation Board. You know, in partnership with groups like PDUSD Students Deserve, we recognize that barriers to educational success can take many forms. Therefore, we've started a Bridge to Wellness Fund that is open to PBUSD students and you know, families that are supporting PBUSD students who live in our area, especially when they're facing emergency situations. And we've got, we just opened those grants, and they're available from anywhere from $10 to $500. We have a range, because we recognize that there's a range of needs. Compassion is why I'm so excited about projects like the Emma Lagasse Culinary Garden and Teaching Kitchen. What an amazing opportunity for our students to connect the work of growing, harvesting, and preparing food to individual and environmental health. And furthermore, to recognize the value that those roles have in our community. Compassion is how we recognize the hardships that we have each faced in the last year and draw strength from finding what is in our power to do. I said at the start that compassion is a gift that we give to ourselves, and I say that because the physiological and psychological effects of taking a compassionate approach 
are profoundly positive. In a time and environment that has demanded so much of so many, compassion is a tool for maintaining our equilibrium. As we wrestle with today's challenges, let us build a scaffolding of courage and grace with compassion as its foundation so that we can face the force, face the future as a force unified in service to the education of our community. Thank you. with everyone today for the expansion of garden-based education in the district. My name is Don Burgett, and I have had the honor and joy of being part of Life Lab for over 10 years. My name is Julie Camacho, and thanks to Don's dream of co-directorship, I've been at Life Lab since 2019. And what an extraordinary time to be here. Today, we're going to talk briefly about cultivating love, cultivando amor. Love of learning, love of healthy food, and love of nature. For over 40, since, uh, for over 42 years, Lighthouse has been planting these seeds of love and envisioning a day when all public schools in Santa Cruz County can have robust garden classrooms, ideal soils where these seeds can blossom. The growing PBUSD partnership is leading this vision. In fact, PBU is leading locally and nationally. We survey more than 100 teachers uh, each year at our partner schools about the impact of our PBSC Garden Classroom program. They consistently tell us that the programs improve their students' scientific knowledge, enthusiasm for learning, connection to the natural world, and pride in their school and as well as having, quote, a positive impact on my students' emotional well-being. The gardens are common spaces of solace when, when needed, which has been particularly important since March of 2020. We were honored to be part of the District Safe Spaces program this year, and students told us how meaningful these spaces were for them. Here, maybe, is a short video. <laughs> how are we doing? Video, no video. We'll see. Okay. We wanted we always want to bring the kids and the gardens into the room with us, so uh, if it works, then we'll get to do that a little bit. In the meantime I can share with you uh, a few stories and a few experiences because it's really in the connection of the students with the garden and the students with the instructors that the magic happens and that that love we get to see it um, and we get to witness uh, one story that we've shared and we shared it at the um, to the school board is a student this summer um, who was doing an activity a watercoloring activity and the student um, wanted to make sure to give a note to the garden and told the instructor, our instructor Lila, that, is it ready? Okay, then let's see that. <laughs> the student, what they did is they wrote a note and said, this note 
is for the guard. The instructor then had, was curious, went to go look at after the class, went to go look at the note, and was um, quite impressed with what the student had to tell the guard. Um, the student went home, and the instructor came back and said, I wanted to ask permission to read that note and to share it with others. The student gave us permission. It's in my, uh, but it said something like this. Dear Garden, I like to be here. When I'm mad or sad, being here makes me good. And makes was spelled M-A-C-K. The student is certainly an English learner like myself. And this note was for the garden. There's a relationship with the garden. The garden becomes our teacher. So, uh, thank you so much. I'm glad we could share that story as well. And this um, is a, a brief uh, bit of garden time with the kids. Um, this was actually an exciting thing for the, uh, the Safe Spaces students at, our, at the Radcliffe Elementary site. Uh, they uh, got to represent Watsonville and PBSD to the nation. So, um, this was part of a national event highlighting seven communities from Hawaii across the country and ending in Washington, D.C. Secretary of Agriculture introduced it, and uh, the kids at Radcliffe uh, got to share their experience. Hola, que tal? Alejandro here, coming to you from Watsonville, California, original homeland of the Amamutsin tribal land. Watsonville has super fertile farmland and produces nearly half of all strawberries grown in the U.S. So next time you take a bite of one of those delicious berries, remember us and the hardworking families that take care of the land. Hi, my name is Lila and I'm one of the garden educators here at Radcliffe Elementary School. After the students finish their virtual classes, Alejandro and I lead social emotional games, nature exploration, and garden activities. Since we have such a small group of kids, we've been able to form a close bond with them and explore what they need. I'll pass it off to our amazing students to tell you more. Being in a classroom and a garden is like different because you can be outside in the rain and you can like plant stuff and you can like see animals and insects. I feel happy it's because we always have fun and we always play some games that I know and we also water the plants. And we always have fun with Lila and Alejandro. My favorite thing to do in the garden is um, looking for animals such as snails or worms. My favorite thing to do in the garden is plant flowers, catch bees, and then just release them at the end. My favorite thing to do in the garden is water plants and it's grow blueberries. I think it would be nice for most schools to have a garden because it's like a space where kids can go to to be calm. Every school should have a garden because it like relaxes you and like calms you down from like Zoom and stuff. When I'm in the garden, I feel peaceful and relaxed. It's beautiful to see all the flowers and the animals that are here. Hi, my name is Jasmine. I am Ariel. And today we're going to do the table exit. We're gonna use tape and put it in our wrist. So the sticky part is gonna be facing now. Now we're gonna just add flowers, rocks, and bread. This is our bracelet. Thanks for watching. I hope that you try this at home. Bye. Bye. <laughs> this has been a really tough year for everyone, but here in the garden, we've been able to find joy, build friendships, and connect with nature. We hope we inspire you to connect with nature too. Bye!
ya no le tengo miedo a nada. <laughs> the social and emotional benefits of Farden classrooms continue to be vital as all students reacclimate to this in-person school lives. We're also thrilled to get back to our next generation science in the garden lessons and to grow our capacity this year so that we can double up on those lessons and help students catch up on the concepts they missed last year. Seeing these impacts inspired Life Lab and PBUSD to scale up our partnership and grow our partner schools program from 3,900 students in seven schools currently to nearly 9,000 students in PBUSD's 16 elementary schools. Starting next fall, we will have three new partner school sites each year uh, until all 16 are on board by fall of 2024. We're also excited to grow the programs at Starlight Elementary um, with additional instructors and new facilities there for students, teachers, and for the community. PBUSD is making a generational investment in garden classrooms as core assets for learning and wellness. To complete and to complement this investment, Life Hub is raising $350,000 for, for a year, for the next four years. And we need your partnership to succeed. These funds will ensure the curriculum, training, evaluation, and basic support systems, like our Main Street office just a block away, are all there to support growing team, our growing team and more schools and more students. If you'd like to learn more and be part of this beautiful work, we would love to connect with you and we look forward to that. Um, Dawn at lifelab.org, Hudik at lifelab.org. Send us a note anytime or come see us today. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's so many partnerships that happen. Some people didn't even know each other at the start of the pandemic, and look at all we've done together. But I think what I really want to say is this next step with children is that we all learn and we all grow in relationships with each other. And we've really proven this last year and a half the strength of our relationships and our care for each other and for kids. And what I most want to say is that Today, make sure your interactions with a child somewhere in this community are balanced with the sensitivity and awareness of how they are doing, with the encouragement that they need, with a chance to, be, to learn something new, and to develop all their skills by doing new things. We all learn because we have that balance of interactions that helps us to grow. And we know our kids are out of balance right now. They haven't had those experiences and those interactions. And it's up to all of us Right? The reason why we're partners with PBUSD is because we believe that it's up to all of us to reach out to a child today, to give them those interactions, to give them that experience that helps them to care for this community as they grow older. So I just thank you all so much. I look at the faces in this room and it's like, oh my gosh, what we, what we did. We should feel really good about that. And it's so far from over. And uh, keep taking care of yourselves and giving those kids those interactions they need. Thanks so much for all you've done this year.
to disagree very much, but I think Susan Chu and CEC, they are a very constant partner. They're all <laughs> the best. Thank you. We all are. I actually, um, our next guest is a tireless advocate in our community. Maria Elena de la Garza with Community Action Board. Thank you for being with us, Maria Elena, and welcome. <laughs> Buenos dias. Buenos dias. You all, those of you who know me know that I prefer to be out here than back there. So bear with me if I walk around the room a little bit. Um, I am Marielena de la Garza and I have the honor of the, and the privilege to work in the blue building over there in the corner. In the beautiful blue building that if there's ever an earthquake, that's where you want to be because it stands the test of time. <laughs> I represent the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County and we exist to eliminate poverty and create social change. And we do that in a very special way and we've been doing it for you know how many years? Over 50. Yeah, 56 years. <laughs> after 20 months of the most difficult time we have ever experienced as a community and as a nation. The work that we do at CAF gives us insight to what is happening at all layers of this community. We have provided rental assistance to this community for over 56 years and in the last 20 months through our economic relief and crisis response, we have been able to facilitate, get this, $4 million to the community that we serve for economic relief. $4 million in mostly $500 checks. Imagine what that takes. Imagine what the need is. In the last 20 months, our team has been responsive to the community to understand what those needs are and to listen to what the community is telling us about where they stand during these 20 months. And we learned a lot. We just did a, a, our community action plan, which we do every two years, to see what poverty looks like, feels like. Has it changed? Has it shifted? And what we learned, um, no one has. We know what's going on in our community. If you live in Watsonville, you can walk out your door and you know exactly what's going on in this community. We know that we have rental assistance, that people need rental assistance. And that was our number two issue that came up, right, from the community. Number one, what do you think? Food was number three. Housing, Housing was number two. No. no? That, that was a little bit lower. Number one was loss of employment. In our community, our families told us that they lost employment or reduction of, of, of opportunities for employment. And that created the stress, right, that we are still dealing with today. And so I want to share something that, that motivates the work that we do. And it's a dicho from my mom. And you all know that I like dichos. And she used to say, Cada quien pone su granito de arena. Every person puts their grain of sand. Right, or their grain of salt, right, in your little pocket. Everyone <laughs> contributes. We couldn't do this work. We couldn't respond by offering employment services at CAB, by offering rental assistance at CAB, and by offering one of our most popular services. What do you think it is? Immigration? Who said it? Woo, yes, immigration <laughs> services. We offer free legal services to answer immigration questions to our community. Did anybody watch Univision last night? You missed a great report. Five of, of, of one family of mom and dad and three siblings all became citizens. 
that changes the world. That changes the world. So those are the granitos that we contribute. Those are the grains that we contribute. And we couldn't do it without the contribution of your grains, of your granitos, Willie. We couldn't distribute food without Willie and his team. We couldn't distribute, yes, please. <laughs> Economic relief without Community Foundation and its donors. And we couldn't wrap around supportive services for our young folks without the confianza of the school district. So thank you. So I want to say we still stand and we need to celebrate that. I want to say thank you to the young people in our room in the room. Because you all should help us show up to work every day because we care and we want to support you to success. That's what we're here for, to be of service. Thank you for your partnership, school district. Thank you for your leadership for surfing those waves. <laughs> we did it. We got more to do. We got more to do. But if each of us contribute our granito de arena, in what we do, what we know, and what we bring, we will make a difference and continue to make a difference in this community. Muchísimas gracias. Estamos para servirles. We are here to be of service. Gracias. So passionate, Maria Elena. So we are standing, and I think, actually believe we're standing so much stronger, you know, so much stronger as a community. So thank you, Maria Elena for all you do for our families. Um, and um, we now are here. We're going to listen now to the Aptos um, Chamber Choir with the direction of Ms. Holly Otta. Thank you so much for being with us and for staying throughout the event. Welcome, students. It's all about you. <laughs>
Now for the making beds. I am proud to introduce our superintendent, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. In August, Dr. Rodriguez celebrated her fifth year with us. Meeting this district. And she leads this district into what our students deserve every single day. Dr. Rodriguez, it is an honor to have you here. Thank you. can never be complete without some technical difficulty. <laughs> whether, whether we come the night before or not, it, it doesn't really matter. So, <laughs> so um, hopefully what you see around you is students. So whether it's the pictures that are here or the students when you came in or the students that are still present or the ones that cheered you in, we have that purposely because we want to have a constant reminder that everything we do, everything we do is with the students in mind. Sometimes it's not what's easiest for adults. Sometimes it's not what people perceive as being best for others. But in our heart, we know what we believe is best for students. And um, so this year, we have a focus on whole child, whole family, whole community. And we did that because through the pandemic, we saw more than ever that we are so interconnected, that everything that we do affects those around us, and everything that we can do, what's possible to do, requires all of us. And so we have, we serve over 19,000 students. We have 2,500 employees that every day come wanting to do what's best for our students, wanting to do what is best for our community so that we can really grow. And so we have LCAP goals. We have seven of them. They're too small to see, but they're in your brochure right there. But the reason why we have them up there is because those are our constant reminders of what are our priorities. What do we believe is important? And then we have our core values, which is how are we going to get there? What type of fortitude, what type of attributes are we going to have to have as a community, as an educational community, to make sure that those seven goals go through? And if you were to look at what those goals were five years ago to now, you'll say, well, they're in the same strand, the same area, but they're a lot different. They are so much more complex. Did you used to know, for example, on visual and performing arts, our goal used to be that they just had a credential teacher. That is what the goal was, just get you a credential teacher. Now, through the leadership of Sue Grothy, now we have, we have music, art throughout the schools in every single middle school, in every single high school, and by 2024, every elementary school. So you saw, you saw earlier today, you heard from Save the Music. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But that will allow every child by 2024 to have gardening and arts and music in their in their educational experience every single week, right? And so we're really excited about the work um, that we're doing. And we have had a challenging year. 2020 was, was, was challenging. But what I think it also showed us was that we are the center of what our community needs. So whether it was food and nutrition, where with the support of our Food and Nutrition Services Department and Second Harvest Food Bank, we gave out seven million meals. Seven million meals in one year, right? So think if we hadn't have been able to do that, how much food insecurity above and beyond there would have been. How many more students and families would have been hungry if we wouldn't have been able to do that? And we said, we learned that, so let's not stop. So now, every single child, doesn't matter what your parent makes, can eat 
breakfast and lunch for free in the schools, right? So we knew, we said we learned a lot in 2020. So let's now not move back to where we were. Let's just continue forward. And then talking about um, technical support. So our IT team who has been here scurrying, you've seen them trying to get the, the sound going. Luckily, like Alicia said, she has a loud voice. I have a loud voice. No one's ever told me to talk, to, to talk louder. They always say talk quieter. We have our tech department was really the backbone of most departments last year. They did 15,540 calls. They took in one year almost 16,000 phone calls to be out for parents, for teachers, for students who said, you're expecting me to, to do distance learning. I don't know how to do it. And so they took those. And when they said, you know what, sometimes a phone call isn't good enough. Let's have them be able to drive through. They took 1,500 people in person and gave them brand new laptops or fixed it right there on the spot, right? And so we are continuing that tech support. So every single, every single school, whether it's elementary, middle, or high, has tech support that families can come and really get that, that need for, from us. And um, we're going to be, um, we're going to continue our work with elevating voices. So we used to depend a lot on in, in person. And then when the pandemic hit, we were like, we can't depend on that any longer because everybody was behind the screen. So we said, how are we going to continue to elevate their voices? So we did multiple surveys. We started doing town halls. And we heard what people were asking for, right? We worked with our partners to hear what they were hearing. And then we also heard. So we had over 20,249 responses to our surveys alone, right? And so we want to, again, continuing those best practices, keep doing what we're doing so that people know we are listening to them. And so we knew it was going to be a hard year from those surveys. We knew it was going to be a hard year. Um, we knew transitioning back, our bodies get used to doing things one way, right? It's actually amazing if we realize how quickly um, we can change our habits. So doing 15 months of something else caused us to now, when we're trying to go back to in person, it, it's, it's a challenge, right? And so we knew that. Our surveys told us that. And so we did, um, we, we started, we decided to do CARES this year, which stands for Connect, Accelerate, Recover, Enrich, and Succeed. And we're going to go into the classroom in just a minute. Um, and, but I want you to, I want to show them the video though real quick. Um, so I want to show you um, this video um, on, care, on our CARES. And, um, and then we will be going into the classroom to see some innovation in action. I think, it, I think we are. <laughs> do, you, do you know why it's not done? Whole child, whole family, whole community is an expansion of our original focus on the whole child, which began in 2019. 
As an educational community, we are more committed than ever to cultivate the passions, interests, and talents of each and every child, strengthen our social-emotional well-being, and lift them up through an expanded definition of student success so they reach their unlimited potential. We value the support of our families that they give their children every day and recognize the impact of this care on our community's collective well-being. Educating the whole child means that we are able to connect with the mind and the body and the vibrancy and the life within us and that we are able to really nurture children through a connection with their own emotions, their ability to articulate those emotions, and their ability to be able to be agents of their own life, to have agency, to feel that they belong, and that to feel that their identity is in, as important as anyone else's. As an educator, it's immensely important that I have some sort of connection with families because this is what's going to allow students to feel supported, not just at school, not just on campus, but also at home. As we grow, have our family grow and flourish with us. That encouragement is what truly unites us and that's really what's going to uplift our community. That's what's going to allow our students to say, I want to stay and be the leader that they can be. Own being bilingual. Own having their accents. Embracing who they are and their identities and bringing their culture to the table. Part on set. Sound. Speeding. Camera. Forward. Scene four, take three. Marker. What I want for PBUSD students is the same as what all of PBUSD's partners want. We want our students to thrive. We want our students to have the skills they need to be successful. We also want them to have the relationships that will encourage them forward. We want students to feel connected to job opportunities, to understand that college can be for them if they want it. We want students to have a sense of incredible opportunity. And that happens in an ecosystem where all of us partners can come together with the district. PBUSD, our students, families, and staff are further supported by an ecosystem of over 60 community partner organizations. philosophy right our philosophy around the whole child whole family whole community um, but also I wanted you to see glimpses of what it's like now to be in a classroom in PBUSD right I wanted you to see the engagement um, that our students are having um, and now because a video is not quite enough ever um, you are going to now stream in live to a classroom at um, Valencia Elementary. Valencia Elementary is our first um, computer science immersion school. And um, they do, uh, they have been working with um, media and with technology at a higher level um, than most of our schools. And um, we're going to be going into a sixth grade a classroom and seeing um, them in action working on a social studies and scratch activity. And um, so here we go. Welcome, Karen. Hold on. Wait, did you Hold on.
Karen, can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you. Hold on, just a second. Can you hear us? Yes. Okay, we can hear you. <laughs> All right, good morning from Lawrence Elementary School. We are so excited to share our coding work with you this morning. Three years ago, we were so grateful to be invited to bring coding to our students here at Valencia. We were provided with all of the devices and curriculum and coaching support, and we brought in more teachers in year two. Another exciting thing that happened in year two was that we were able to start to marry our classroom curriculum with the coding work that we were doing. And so that's what we're excited to show you today in Mr. Miller's sixth grade classroom. So let's go ahead and head on in and we'll ask him his perspective on how coding enhances the uh, educational experiences of our students. So come on in. Hey, Mrs. Lane. Come on up and join us. So Mr. Miller, if you can, uh, thank you for inviting us in today. You're welcome. If you can, oh, that's, uh, if you can go into a little bit about how you think um, this coding work enhances and engages um, students in their learning. Because a number of years ago, we, I just felt comfortable doing the hour of code, which we had in December. But then when Code for the Future came to Valencia, it gave me the ability to have the confidence to introduce coding into the classroom. And a couple of things that I've noticed is one, how the kids persevere. And, per and when they come across a problem, they either solve it themselves or they check in with their, their classmates. Classmates are ready to help. And um, it's been really fun as an extension to the content of the instruction. Great. I know social studies is the main area that you're right. in. Right. Exactly. Okay, great. Well, we're going to talk to some of your students now. I know they're all part at work on their current projects. So, hi, Siri, how are you? Hi. Nice to see you. Can you tell, a little bit, uh, tell us a little bit about what um, you've been learning about and then what was your task with this Scratch project? So, we've been learning about the Sumerians and our task was to create a project and um, write their problems and the solutions to um, what their challenges were. Okay. And so, can you take a look at your screen here? Can you show us a little bit about um, how it works? Yes. So um, you click the flag, and the dragon will give you instructions. Okay. And this dragon's name is Joe. All right. And so if you can show us what um, some of the other buttons do in your project. So um, this one is um, the, the problem about an uncontrolled water supply in the river valley. Okay. And then the problem is on top, and the solution is on the bottom. Okay, and these are problems for which people? The Sumerians. Okay, and so some of their maybe farming challenges yes. at the time? Okay, and can you show us our um, next button? Okay, and so what was one of the other problems that they faced? Um, attacked by neighboring communities. Okay, all right, and then that home button will take us back to yes. your main map. Okay. And what is this part? And this one's about building and maintaining an irrigation system. Okay, so big challenges, but those yes. really good, right? Okay, and then um, final button is about the food shortages in the hills. Okay, so you were the one to to build this from scratch, it's scratch, right? Okay, and can you show us the coding portion? Yes. So when you're in behind the scenes. So here's the first button. Okay, and so how did you learn how to pull these pieces together? How did you learn to uh, build this code? Um, the coding and the help we had was a lot of help, and I learned how to use the buttons okay. to um, help. And um, then I kind of got used to using the hide and show buttons and how to code it all. Okay, great. And, and what do you like the most about being able to show your learning in this way? Um, I like it because we get to like do what we want to do and code the buttons how we want to code them while still showing what we're learning about. Okay, so a lot of choice in yeah. that, right? And what do you think is the most challenging part of this kind of work? Um, probably coding the buttons because the backdrops kind of like switch around a lot, so you have to re-switch the backdrops to the right ones mm -hmm. when you're coding the buttons so you kind of know what you're doing. So a lot of trial and error, like Mr. Miller said, persevering, pushing through, right? Okay. Well, awesome job. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. All right, Jeff, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about, I know um, you're all working on your current project, but um, this is actually your second project, 
Tell us about the first project that you all worked on. What were you all learning about? Uh, so we were learning about um, early humans and prehistoric humans. Okay, and so what were you asked to do? We, so we had to make a project with three of the, the prehistoric um, species of humans and write, um, like, make buttons and then write about them. Back with, about that, that particular. Okay. All right, so can you click us through your presentation? Yeah, so, can... so the first one was the Homo sapien, and then there's text. And so you had to pull all of the images. You had to create all of the text. You had to create backgrounds or find backgrounds. Yeah. yeah? Okay, way to go. And then the next one is for Homo erectus. Are there any interruptions, students? Are there any interruptions? Just one moment. See, we're in a real school. <laughs> yes, this is, this is live, real time. Here we go. Okay. And tell us, tell us more about this page. Um, so this is for Homo erectus, and yeah, so that's the skull of it, and then there's information. That's your text? Yeah. And so did you have to do research prior to even starting the Scratch yeah. Project? Okay. Great. And then this is the last one of Homo erectus. Okay. Can you show us the coding part of yeah. your design here? So, wait, okay, so it's good. So, so, is that for first, that, first button? That was for the home button, but okay. then there's, this is the first button, and then there's all the other ones. Okay, so tell me, when you um, hit a snag in your design, what are your, what are your strategies? What do you do to work through um, it? Sometimes I just like do start, that, that, like I find which part isn't working, and then just throw that away and then start that. Okay, are you left on your own, or do you have, who else can you go to um, to help you through it? Mr. Miller helps a lot, and then some other class that helps too. Great. All right. Thank you so much. Do you like, do you like being able to show it, you know, in this yeah. way? Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Do we have time for one more? Um, yeah, let's do one more. Okay. All right. Bye. Okay, so we, we were saying you're working on the current project, right? Okay, and tell us again what that is about. It is about the fertile crescent. The fertile crescent. Early agriculture. Early agriculture. Okay, and so where are you in your process? I am coding my home button so I can go back to my map. Your map. And where did that map come from? It looks like maybe you created it. I drew it and then I took a picture. Okay, so you drew it, took a picture, and then uploaded it as a background? Yes. And that was one of your options you could select? Okay. And so where um, where are you, you're, are you adding the code right now on mm -hmm. your home button? Yeah, and then I'm going to copy and paste my text from my writing. Okay, and the index Can you show us, do you have a writing, a document that you're working from that you're pulling your text from? I do. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you first took notes. Um, based on all your learning with Mr. Miller and your classmates here, right? Yes. And then I have a table right here of things that I was writing. Okay, so problems and solutions, okay, that you want to, then you're going to incorporate this into your scratch program? Yeah, I'm going to have three buttons that I'll incorporate into it. Okay, so um, how long have you been working on this so far? I've worked on it for, like, I've worked on it three days, or like four days. Okay. And then how long do you think it'll take you to wrap and do the rest of the coding to add this information in? Maybe like 20 minutes. 20 minutes! Oh my gosh! This will take Mrs. Lane probably the rest of the week. So that is a pretty awesome thing. Thank you so much for sharing. What do you, um, what do you like most about sharing your learning in this way? Um, I feel like I get to kind of put my own creative spin on all the work that I'm putting up. Nice! Yeah, it's really, it's really cool that Mr. Miller gives you that choice to be able to share what you know in that way, right? Yeah, I love it. Okay, well, thank you so much, sir. Appreciate you sharing your work with us. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Thanks for All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so Another partnership that we have. So 
We have many partnerships um, within the local community, as you've seen. We also have many national level partnerships. One of those is with um, South Con, so South Con and Con Academy. So we were one of five school districts in the nation that piloted one of his new programs called Map Accelerator. So we're going to be having a, con a live conversation with Sal right now. Uh, where we're going to be able to um, talk to him about innovation. Something that's really important to us here in PBUSD is that we're always innovating and doing new and important things um, for our students. So, Sal, thanks so much for being here. I'm sorry we're running a little bit late. Um, you can't see them, but you have about 100 people looking at you right now. <laughs> and then we're, um, we're going to be streaming. We're streaming as well, and so you'll have... Um, many more people that uh, probably thousands that are going to be watching. So um, thanks so much for, for being here at our state of the district. Um, and so you know a little bit about us because we were one of you, the school districts that you selected for Map Accelerator. So you know that we really appreciate innovation and creativity. So I just wanted to kind of start you I'll start off and just ask you, um, what do you rely on? How do you gain inspiration? Um, for all of the creative and innovative solutions that you have um, for students and the community. Yeah, well, for, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, and I, I definitely want to give you all kudos. We see a lot of school districts around the country and actually around the world. And uh, y'all are actually one of the most um, innovative, capable districts that, that we have seen around. Uh, so uh, we're honored to be creativity. It, you know, my, my, my view, and I think this affects education, but it also affects us as adults. I think all human beings are inherently very, very, very creative. And I think the secret is how do we make sure that we, we don't stifle it and how do we make sure that there's space for that creativity? And so even in, in my day today, uh, you know, I try to have blocks of time, two, three hours, where it's less structured. I, I think many folks, I, I, I'm sure you're in the same position, it's easy to get your whole day scheduled, you're jumping from one these days Zoom meeting to another Zoom meeting. And if you're constantly running from one to another, uh, it's very easy to not have space to take a step back, to con make dots, connect the forest for the trees. Uh, the other thing I do is, and I've been doing this a lot lately, and I, I did it mainly to manage stress, but I found it's actually helped my creativity a lot, is, is to meditate. Uh, you know, there's a, the adage, if, if you don't have time to meditate for 10 minutes, you should meditate for 20. <laughs> and and uh, I, take, I definitely so take I that to heart. Because not, <laughs> <laughs> not, not only does it make you a little bit more aware of yourself, uh, but I find that when you just try to still your mind, your mind actually will, will, will create some pretty interesting connections. Uh, and, and for me, there's different types of creativity, different types of entrepreneurship. I'm definitely someone who, if there's an idea, I'm eager to try it out, experiment, learn from it as quickly as possible, and then iterate from there. But I, you know, I, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's how, at least how I think about it. Yeah, no, we so appreciate that. So we know that you are um, one, of the, one of the key innovators on personalized learning, right? One of your, with Khan Academy and and MAP Accelerator is really looking at what the student needs and then trying to um, provide as, as accurately that, that instruction. What do you think are some of the next steps on personalized learning? Where do you see, um, we're trying to get an inside scoop here, where do you see <laughs> things um, going in terms of personalized learning and learning for students? Yeah, you know, first of all, the word personalized learning is used a lot in education, and it can mean different things to different people. Some people associate personalized learning with, if we're going to get a word problem, you like baseball, I like basketball, but maybe we see a word problem that's personalized to us. Uh, there, there's other forms of personalized learning, too. But the version of personalized learning that we believe strongly in, and it's connected to this, this idea of mastery learning, is that everyone has a unique set of uh, things that they've already mastered and things that they might have forgotten or they just never learned in the first place. Uh, and everyone is ready to learn at different paces. And it actually, even though oftentimes we, we try to judge people on how quickly they're learning something, I always point out that slow does not actually necessarily mean not smart. In fact, to some of the people who take the most time to learn something is because they're really internalizing it. And then they can make some creative leaps to our previous conversation. And we know in a traditional academic school system, and it's at no fault of the system because it's really a compromise that had to be made if you wanted it to be reasonably economic, 
is, and we've been doing this for 200 years, is we'll put students together, 25, 30, 35 students, and then we try our best as educators to give them lectures, do practice, in-class practice, out-of-class practice, uh, but, but every teacher will tell you that those 30, 35 kids are all at different levels, all with different gaps. And oftentimes the things that, that's holding some kids back, it isn't that the instruction they're getting in say sixth grade isn't good, it's because they have some gaps from third grade. You know, the number of classrooms I've visited around the country where there's, there's a handful of kids who just haven't mastered their third grade multiplication tables or whatever else, that becomes really hard for that sixth grade teacher to be able to, to address that. And so what we've always focused on, and I'm, I've always been very clear about this, if I had to pick between an amazing educator and amazing technology, I would pick the amazing educator every time. And then if you had to pick, and then when you talk about technology, it should never be technology for technology's sake. That's a temptation that a lot of folks in Silicon Valley where I am tend to do. Here's something cool, now let's figure out what problem it's solving. It should be the other way around. What's our pedagogical goal? So the pedagogical goal is 30 kids, 35 kids in a room, 25 kids in a room, how do you reach everyone where they are? And then actually, how do you unlock the in-classroom experience so it can facilitate more human-to-human -human interactions? And so that's where Khan Academy has been very focused. That's where Map Accelerator has been very focused. In terms of what's coming up next, it's, we're just continuously looking at the data, seeing how we can make our content better, more engaging for students, how we can improve the recommendations, how we can make the teacher dashboards more actionable, and how we can extend these ideas of mastery learning to more and more subject areas. Math is where we are most deep right now, uh, but we're doing a big push in science now, and I, I hope over the next few years we can go into things like uh, reading comprehension and, and other things. Another thing that I'm really excited about right now, it's early days, is how can mastery on Khan Academy actually connect to opportunities in the real world? Uh, at the high school level, we're actually embarking on a pilot with Howard University. Uh, many of y'all probably know, college algebra, major gating factor for so many kids. Most kids in America, when they get to college, don't even place into college algebra. They place it into remedial math. And college algebra really is just 10th or 11th grade math. Uh, and so what we're doing is we created a mastery-based course called Howard College Algebra. It's really a, a configuration of Algebra 2. And we're, we're taking it to Title I high schools mainstream high schools, these aren't the kids who traditionally take AP tests, and we're going to see if the students get mastery on that, Howard's going to give them transferable college credit. So whether or not they go to Howard, they will get that college credit out of the way before they, frankly, even have a chance to drop out of high school. Uh, so that's just the beginning of it. If it obviously works for college algebra, it could work for, for many, many other things. Uh, also exploring ways that kids, it could help them for college admissions. There's obviously a lot of debate about standardized tests, but can that mastery on Khan Academy be a signal that college admissions or even employers can index on. Well, we so appreciate you being here. If you had one last um, piece of advice to the community that's out there, so we have community partners um, and also administrators, um, staff here. Um, what's, a, what's one piece of advice that you would give them about supporting students? Uh -huh. I think the biggest piece of advice, it's very in vogue these days to talk about things like a growth mindset. The growth mindset is this idea that you either have a fixed or growth mindset. Fixed mindset folks say, I'm either good at math or I'm not. I'm either good at running or I'm not. While some of the growth mindset says, well, I'm, I'm, this is where I am now, but I really won't know my potential unless I step out of my comfort zone, be willing to fail. And failure should not, I should not take that heavily. I should view that as an opportunity to learn, look at the failure, and then keep going. Failure should not be stigmatized. And there's all this evidence that if students have a growth mindset, it improves their academics, it improves their life outcomes, uh, and, and it's good to reinforce students, remind them that failure, nothing wrong with failure, that's actually when you grow the most, your brain is like a muscle, the more you use it, the stronger it gets. So even though we adults say this to students, I think it's very important for we adults to model this for students. So what this goes into the, it's very important for us to be willing to take experiments. And if we happen to fail, that's a good sign. That's a sign that we're pushing ourselves. We learn from this failure and then we keep going. And then the students will see that and say, hey, okay, I can, I can start to internalize this growth mindset as well. And also, as the more that we work with students, the more that we can push ourselves to give students a second or third chance. If a student gets an 80% on a test uh, and wants to get to mastery, it's not cheating to give them another opportunity. Maybe you need to give them a different test, and that's what we try to do on Khan Academy as well. We can give different items, 
But if that student wants to go from an 80 to a 90 to 100 percent, that's actually the exact right behavior that we want to motivate. It's consistent with the growth mindset. So I'd say model it ourselves as adults and make sure we have a lot of space for students to actually be able to live it. Great. Thank you for your partnership. Thank you. Yeah. about a few other innovative practices that we're doing here in PBUSD um, as, we, as we move forward into the 21-22 school year, which, if you can believe, is almost um, a third over already. So time has been um, flying by as we, as we move, move it forward. Do you guys like the interaction that we had? We try to keep it lively for you guys. Um, with show, show, not tell, what we're doing. So we have been doing um, quite a bit of tours um, for the Emerald Lagaki Foundation. And one of the things that we've been um, starting to see is that we're really aligning our district vision to community aspiration. So what our community has been asking of us, um, we are finally um, moving in that same direction. So whether it's Life Lab that you already heard about, um, where we're going to ensure that not just a fortunate seven have it, or nine have it, but 16 um, schools have that support for them. You also saw part in the video, in the CARES video, you saw a little segment um, of Cesar Chavez students um, doing Latino Youth Film Institute. So that's a process in which it starts at Starlight Elementary, goes to um, Cesar Chavez uh, Middle School, and then on now to PBHS. So we have high schoolers all the time that say, let me learn what I want to learn. Why do I have to do English 9? Why do I have to do biology? And so what we're now trying to do is really ensure that students are able to follow their passions, interests, and talents. And so Latino Youth Film Institute is one example of that. So no longer does that set of students have to do English 9. No, they don't have to. They can do screenwriting now. And so they can now get themselves on a pathway that leads them, hopefully, um, to be able to follow um, their passions, um, interests, um, and talents. Um, and you heard about the Emerald Lagasse uh, Culinary Arts Kitchen. So we were are one of five in the nation. Um, five seems to be a good number for us. We were number four, but is now number five that received a half a million dollar grant from Emerald Lagasse in order to be able to have an industry level kitchen at one of our elementary schools. And so students will be able to um, learn and cook within a 1,500 square foot kitchen. It's almost the size of my condo. So it's a big location. And then they're going to be able to go out into an enormous garden that allows them to be able to understand the community in which they learn, be out into, out into the air, and really be able to um, not only have math, science um, involvement, but also be able to nourish their hearts and souls as well at the exact same time. And so CT expansion, so career technical education, so sometimes these people aren't hearing the words ROP much anymore, they're like, they don't do any hands on anymore. They don't do things that are practical. It's actually the opposite. It's actually the opposite of that. So Julie Edwards, who is here, is our coordinator of CT. And two years ago, she took this project on, she took this initiative on, and we have thousands and thousands of high schoolers who are now in programs that allow them to do and learn what they want to learn. Right? And so um, we are really fortunate. You saw some of that in the video. So you might not have thought, oh, wow. 
You have forensic science going on? Yes. You have biotechnology classes? Yes. You have computer science classes? Yes, right? So all those classes are meant so that students start, we're going to keep going down the left. We have it at high school. We're doing some at middle school, and then now we're going to be going into elementary so that kids, they can see all possibilities, right? We don't want children to only see the possibilities that is currently in front of them, but actually see the enormous possibilities that are out there, and then try things on. So my son is currently, he just, he's going to be graduating um, this May, and he was all pre-med, ready to go. Guess what, he, he's doing his internship now. 21 years old, doing his internship now. And guess what he's telling me? I'm not so sure, Mom, that that's what I want to do, right? So four years of college later, <laughs> right? He's making, he's making that aha moment. Um, I guess I'm glad that he's having an aha moment, but it probably would have been great if he would have been able to do that during high school yeah. and said, yeah, not really. Not really, right? Um, so our goal is that we have students that can try things on, right? That can try things on. But the most important thing is regardless, even if they switch courses, like even if my son switches courses, he still has all these skills and knowledge that he can transfer to something else that's really important to him. So it's all, not all for naught, or at least that's what I say as a mom. Um, so we are so fortunate because we do have we do have over 60 partners who daily engage with us and our students and sometimes guess what our partners are the ones that connect with the families our most vulnerable families that we don't actually see so it's so important for us to recognize the work that all of our partners do because some of them whether it's at CAB or Second Harvest Food Bank they go to them and they won't come to us. But if we're partnering with each other, then we will make those connections and then the families eventually will wind up coming to us. And so last year at this very time, I did a call to action to where I wanted us to really have all the community partners come together um, to work with the Greater Pajada Valley Calendar Compact. And so we had over 30 partners who said, we're going to do it. We're going to sit down together, and we are going to decide what is best for our students and community and how each one of us can be a piece of that. And so you'll see we had an activity where people did different quotes and stickies. Um, and you'll see everything from bridging the school-family divide is essential, right? Collective impact, we are stronger together. Or define an audacious, unifying vision of the future which will align the resources and energies of the community, right? And so we, as part of that, are continuing the work with that, with our first ever Family Engagement and Wellness Center, which is going to open in December. Going to open in December. December because we're going to be closed for three weeks. The schools are going to be closed for three weeks. And you know what we said earlier today? We are the hub of the community, right? So we want to make sure that resources are available to our students and families before we shut down. And so this wellness center is going to be open in the afternoons and it's going to be open on Saturdays so that our families can have access to the two wellness center. We're going to eventually have three, maybe more. Our partners are like, let's do more than three. But we've committed three at this point. This one will be at EA Hall. So there's seven locate there's seven portables there. And we are going to be transforming that into a wellness village. <laughs> right? And so PBUSD is going to be um, having, we're doing a phased-in approach. So when December comes, we're going to have this, and then we're going to keep expanding 
but you'll see everything from mental services um, and intake uh, through PBSD, PBPSA, which is a, a really extremely important partner to us, um, is going to be doing the Valor program and mental health services. Community Action Board is going to be supporting us through the Luna y Sol Family <coughs> Center services. Um, Salud para Gente is going to be um, providing supports as well. Second Harvest Food Bank um, through the USDA Food Pantry. And then we have so many other community partners, whether it's prepared meal kits, right? Hot prepared meal kits so that people can come and pick them up or computer center support, right? And all that in one location. So one stop shop in order to be able to support our families. And so my call to action today is for us to recognize that together we can elevate the experience of every, every student. And so I ask us, if you haven't already joined um, the team at the Greater Pajano Valley Town Compact to, to do it, because we're working together, help us reach out to families to tell us of the supports. So many don't know what is at their fingertips, the services that we can provide them, right? So any contacts that you have, please help them to know. Start talking about the Wellness Center. Let them know it's going to be up and running. We are going to be doing a massive campaign around it. And then just acknowledge our, your collective power, right? Because together, all the students that we um, are supporting, and we're going to see, they're, they're peeking at us, they're trying to come in. Um, <laughs> the students that we're going to see right now, they need our collective power. And so thanks so much. Don't get up because we have, we're going to hear students and then we'll be done. So thank you so much. I'm going to introduce uh, Susan Ralti, our coordinator of BAPA, so she can introduce our, our students who are going to join us. Thank you. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. Dr. Rodriguez and the Board of Trustees for really supporting the whole student and the arts are part of that. You learn so many more things than just art in arts, in the arts. The, the students coming to, to the program today, I had the opportunity to get to listen to them and, and then hearing them talk and sing and all of that. What a great way for them to be able to bond and become more confident in themselves. And just getting up there and singing for a group of people that they don't know is another just life skill that we get. So I really appreciate the growth of the program. We, as you can see, five years ago when we first started this, we had um, about a 30-second piece of music. Then we had band. Then we had choir. We had save the music. Um, we have. Our students have the opportunity to have visual performing arts from early on, and by 2024, as Dr. Rodriguez said, they'll have um, the opportunity to have that from kindergarten to 12th grade. Um, we are very, very well lucky to have community partners. If you have a chance, in every floor of this building, there's over 450 pieces of visual artwork that um, the PBA helped us um, curate and put up. And so that's another beautiful show, and they're, like I said, it's on every floor of this building. So take a second and walk down the hall if you can. Um, as our students grow, our programs are growing with them, and we're very happy to be able to provide that for our students. The group that you're going to hear right now is El Sistema. They run through extended learning, and we are so fortunate to have them as a partner as well. This um, fall, in the next few weeks, we'll be starting a community orchestra for a uh, student community orchestra at EA Hall. And that's going to give students the opportunity that want to deepen their musical skills. They'll have an opportunity to do that through the community orchestra. Um, and it's, it's just another way that, that our district is really embracing the partners that are coming to the table to work with our students. And to, and to grow it. We're growing the Latino Youth Cinema Project as well. Um, the choir today, you guys 
brought tears to my eyes. Thank you. Thank you, but no, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, and we're just so fortunate to have a leadership that really wants the whole child to thrive. I'm giving them a second. And so these students are from Radcliffe Elementary. This program's been going, uh, this is the fourth year now. And, um, and it's a lot of the students from this program are now going to be the, the, the meat of the um, youth, youth sy symphony that's starting. And um, it's just been great to watch the change in the students. Last year during the pandemic, um, I had the opportunity to get to go to a lot of art classes, and art and music classes every day online. And it was just really interesting um, to see the students, to hear them talk as they're doing whatever they were doing, but that banter between each other. And, and it was, it just really made my heart happy to know that they had something that they could do every day to enrich themselves and to make themselves feel whole. And I think that's one of the things um, that, that the arts provides that other curricular areas might not always have the chance. But there is so much you can learn through this. Um, I also had the opportunity to be in the classroom a lot to sub recently, and, um, which has been great because I, I'm, as, as I was um, working with some flutes the other day, I was like, so how do you think that sound is developed? Where, where is that coming from? What is it? And why, when you go high, what's happening to the air? When you go low, what's happening to the air? And then we started talking about the physics of sound and how that comes through. And so there's so many things that you could connect with it. And it was, it's just been really a, a pleasant surprise. Amalia, are you ready? You're ready? Okay. Great. Thank you guys for having, for having me.
absolutely wonderful. Thank so, you. Bravo. Bravo. They donated, uh, Driscoll donated the berries. If you want, please feel free to take them off. And uh, Guadalajara Bakery gave us a delicious Mexican pastry. And uh, Starbucks donated the coffee. And La Colmena donated, and La Colmena donated the waters and the juices. So we're very grateful to our community for their generosity. I also like to let you know that on that table we have one sheet, cheers with a lot of <laughs> we have flyers with a lot of information, <laughs> and a lot of them, uh, um, they are referenced in our state of the district, just so you can dive a little bit, a little bit deeper into what those programs are. And um, with that, I would like to thank the audience, the dear community partners, staff, and uh, for joining us. You have made this a very memorable state of the district. So did the lack of staff. <laughs> I look forward to next year's event um, and saying hello to you again. So thank you for being here. And feel free to stay a little bit longer and have some cafe fun and, and read and mingle. Thank you very much.